So I'm so excited to have um, a special guest, Dr. Jessica Smedley, also known as Dr. Jess, on us to have our conversation. Today we will we'll be covering Black resistance um, and Black romance and mental health. So we're thinking about, we're talking about, you know, our main theme is Black resistance. And then we're looking at how mental health interplays with different topics. And the topic for this week is Black romance. So I'm so excited to have you on here, Dr. Jess. We've had other conversations before, and I know like we can go on and on. So I'm just going to love, just love, want to thank you for me willing to join this conversation. And I can't wait to share with our audience all that you have to share. Thank you so much for the invitation. It is of great course. to be here. And yes, we can go on and on. So <laughs> this will be a great conversation. <laughs> yes. So do you want to do a quick intro about who you are and what you're doing um, currently? Sure. So I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Washington, D.C., uh, independent practice, Smedley Psychological Services. I teach part-time at Howard University, which is very exciting. Likewise, at George Washington University. Um, I am the president-elect at DC Psychological Association and very active in APA leadership uh, and recently co-authored a very exciting, groundbreaking book, which is why we're talking today, right? Before the broom. Yeah. So yes. that uh, are some of the things that keep me occupied. I love it. I'll add an author to your titles. Love it. Love it. <laughs> so I think that's a great segue. So you wrote this book, it's called Before the Broom. So tell us what was going on in the community that really inspired and think about the Black community. What, what was happening in the Black community that really inspired you to write this book, to want to be part of this project of writing Before the Broom? Absolutely. So I obviously have to give credit to my co-authors, uh, Dr. Erica Holmes and Dr. Renicia Lark, uh, who are in California. Uh, Dr. Holmes and I go back to the early 2000s, where I was in my early graduate training, um, and both have a history of, you know, couples and uh, marriage work in the past. And so she invited me to this project. We actually co-authored a textbook chapter too, which will be out later this spring. Uh, that'll be in a Black couples therapy textbook. And so as an uh, outsource of that, we wrote this book to say, hey, we wrote this textbook chapter an argument of why a premarital curriculum is needed for Black couples. So let's go ahead and write the curriculum in that workbook also. Uh, and is... so, yeah, so she's extremely creative and, <laughs> you know, excited about the field, obviously. But we know that there's lots of couples work that's amazing, you know, the Gottmans and uh, Hendrix and, you know, all these amazing writers that are out there. But there's nothing out there specific specifically for us. Yes, I was so interested that you say that because I was looking around, someone had mentioned the Gottman's. I was like, oh, what is there for us? So I'm just excited to see what you all will do with this because I can, I'm already imagining like 50 things you could do with that. Yeah. But let's talk about what's the, so the title is Before the Broom mm -hmm. and it comes from this whole idea, jumping the broom is I assume. So let's talk about what does jumping the room represent? How does that represent Black resistance? Absolutely. So the history of the broom, and I, I don't have all the resources immediately handy, but the history of the broom goes far back to Africa. And the sticks of the broom historically represented the foundation of a home. When a couple got married, the sticks represent the foundation. This is how we're going to build. Over time, as the culture came uh, to the States, um, jumping the room became more of a symbolic representation of resistance because we know that uh, people who were enslaved were um, forbidden to, to marry. And so rather than going through you know, a formal uh, process that was accessible to everyone, jumping the room was extremely important to our liberation, to our celebration, to mm -hmm. our culturally relevant symbolism of love mm -hmm. and commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is, you know, it's interesting because I had never heard about it till I came to this country. And and what, a, like you said, what a beautiful way that we've been able to kind of work around, right? We we're always figuring out kind of the workaround. And so while black couples were 
prohibited from legal marriage, they found using the broom as a symbolize uh, to symbolize their union. Mm -hmm. So just love that. Again, that 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 resistance has been there throughout this whole period of enslavement. Right. So as we think about black romance um, and black love, what are some just a few qualities that you think make up a healthy or successful relationship? What are things as, as we, you know, we're talking to couples out there, we're listening in. Um, what are some signs of a good, healthy relationship? And we know like, you know, couples, you know, one of my friends always told me like marriage is hard work, it's work, right? But what are some of those foundational things, right? Everything is, every day isn't going to be peachy and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and happiness necessarily, right? There are going to be periods of conflict. But what are those signs that lets you know that the person that you're with, this is someone who I can be with, this is going to be a healthy, successful relationship? Absolutely. So one of the things that I often say to peers, to clients, to anyone I'm speaking about with couples is never underestimate the power of honesty and vulnerability mm -hmm. because that informs a sense of emotional safety, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I speak of honesty, it's beyond the integrity of, you know, oh, no cheating. Sure, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. nobody wants mm -hmm. that sort of uh, issue in their relationship. But everyday honesty, people have a hard time saying, I don't like that meal that you cook, or mm -hmm. I don't like when you leave your shoes over here. Mm -hmm. There are all these fears about these trivial feedback comments. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we think about vulnerability, it's, it's an issue of safety. And so it's, are you okay giving feedback? Are you okay talking about past pain from mm -hmm. family or parents or fears even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that those two qualities are often taken for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if we can attack that issue of honesty and, and um, vulnerability, then we have a great foundation to be able to then talk about mm -hmm. in-laws, right. right. children, <laughs> money, <laughs> right? Exactly. all of the right. things that we think yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. So that honesty is, I know you talked about kind of sharing feedback, but also that vulnerability is to be able to receive that, right? And to not mm -hmm. lash out when you get that feedback, to mm -hmm. receive that with a sense of love that it was given, right? Right. That allows the couple to, again, create that emotional safety in that relationship. Like, I, I may have hard things to say to you, right. um, but you can take it. It may not feel good, right? Because sometimes, you know, you know, 20 years into the relationship with my husband, right? There are things that that are said to me and, you know, now I'm getting used to like the style or, you know, and, and there are times where we've had to say like, actually, I don't like when you say this thing. Right. Can you say this? I'm going to hear it better if you say it this way, mm -hmm. right? And so that ability to have that communication too, I think also that communication is like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the foundation of that honesty and that vulnerability as well. Absolutely. That is, yeah, and just think about that, right? In, in like, how are, you, how are you vulnerable with someone you're, you're meeting, right? And how does that show up from day one to, you know, year 50 in that relationship? <laughs> and it grows and evolves, right? But so important to, you know, it is something that, you know, you have to continually be working on mm -hmm. and not taking it for granted. Absolutely. And that's why we're focusing on couples, but that's also why individual work is important. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times we might have our own blind spots that remind, that require some maintenance or check-ins mm -hmm. over time, mm -hmm. just to make sure that we're not taking out inappropriate things on our partners. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So you're in a relationship and there you're, you're coming to a place of honesty and vulnerability. You know, we're talking to people who maybe, you know, recently partnering up or, you know, in, in a relationship for some time. And I, again, I think that, you know, relationships are journeys, right. And so, mm -hmm. I think another healthy thing within a relationship is you're growing together. So you're talking about that individual, right? So you're people as individuals coming into this union. Um, and sometimes what I've seen is people kind of lose who they are in service of the other person, right? right? And so, you know, let's talk about what are some of those relationship red flags, things mm. that or signs that a relationship is not going well. So I just named one, right? Where you aren't allowed to be yourself you're, or you kind of dim yourself or put yourself last 
in service of the partner, mm-hmm. right? And I've seen relationships then where you're not growing, you're creating the space for this other person to grow and then you get, they outgrow you, right? right. And so how are we continually growing in a relationship? So what are some of those red flags? What are some of those relationship red flags that you might call out? Right. Yeah, I love that you already highlighted the imbalance that can happen, uh, which is why it's so important to discuss value systems. Mm. Because if our values don't match, then that absolutely serves as red flags. Mm-hmm. Uh, often when we think about red flags, we go automatically to the safety issues or Mm-hmm. violence issues or abuse issues mm-hmm. which are extremely important mm-hmm. but there are also these subtle things like differences in how you see raising children or mm-hmm. your faith you know practices uh mm-hmm. or money issues or boundaries with family members and the in-laws mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. blended families if you come to the relationship with children mm-hmm. and so having these differences in values can absolutely spark you know, issues down the road. So, but Dr. Jess, like talking about values, is that sexy? Like, is that like people started to date? It's like, how does that come up, right? Like, I'm just like, those don't always seem to be the like fun, exciting things when people are starting to get, get together, right? Do you have these sit down and have a conversation about values? Does it just kind of come mm-hmm. up? And part of it, like, you have to know what your values are first, right? right? Before you can even have that conversation or assess whether that person kind of matches or aligns. But yeah, how is it? Because that when you when we were talking about that, I'm like, a couple's really going to sit down and have a conversation <laughs> about value. I'm like, what does that look like, right? Let's be real here. <laughs> it may not be a black and white checklist, but when you're going on these dates and you're having conversations, it's about yeah. being intentional. Yeah. And okay. so historically, we haven't been taught dating skills, if you will. Mm, right? <laughs> we have ideas okay. in our heads about mm-hmm. boy meets girl, person meets person. There's a chemistry, right? Yep. Boom. <laughs> the big bang. <laughs> it's supposed to automatically fall in place because we're connected. We like each other. But we haven't talked about how we were raised, how we spend money, how we see ourselves raising children, what our own emotional behavioral patterns are, what our needs are, what our routines are, Mm -hmm. uh, what our faith practices are. Mm -hmm. And so if we go into a dating situation being very intentional and Mm self-aware, the more likely we will have better outcomes with dating and long-term relationships. Right. Okay. I love that. So I'm already hearing a thing that you could do, a practical thing is to spend some time, journal, write it down, talking about what are the things that are important to you? What are the values? How do you articulate your own values first Mm -hmm. before you even go out on those dates, right? right? Spend some time with yourself thinking about what your values are. And then it's like the listening. Then when I'm meeting with people, I'm listening for how they talk about their own family, how they talk Mm -hmm. about their mom or their dad, right? Mm -hmm. How they talk about money, how they spend money when we're together. Right. So those things align. And I think one of the things that I've noticed is um, people often, I, I, people often are showing you their best selves when you're Mm -hmm. dating. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and a friend also shared this to me, like you can't expect people to change. People are who they are. So if the behavior that you're seeing when you're dating, don't think that that's going to change once you get married or or, or form some long-term relationship. But that is just, you can imagine that that's the best that you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And if that's not working for you in that moment, then it's not, you cannot, not that people can't change, but that imagine that they're putting forward their best foot when they're, they're, when you're dating in that relationship. Would you agree with that? Would you? I generally do. I think that there is an important topic around developmental stages of life and development. And so I think dating in 20s and 30s looks different from dating in 40s, 50s and 60s, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a general uh, difference in evolving character, integrity and understanding life experiences. And so I think that's an important conversation. Uh, But generally, Yes, I do think that that uh, mm-hmm. that certainly matters in how we show up. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so one more question, and then this last question, and then we'll kind of share any anything that you want to uh, any tips you want to share for 
our Black romance folks out there. So, you know, I know you do a lot with your um, with your faith and with, with Black churches. And we have this idea of couples therapy as an intervention, right? And you know, I know sometimes people worry about couples. I hear a number of people, you know, in relationship, one one person may want to do the couples therapy, one person doesn't want to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's a lot of, I think, kind of stigma around couples th- therapy in general, but then couples therapy, people may feel they're not going to get a fair shake mm-hmm. in the therapy process. So we want you to know that couples therapists, you definitely want to make sure the person is trained to, to, um, to, to provide couples therapy because th- that is a special training um, that people go through. And that, you know, the therapist does not take sides, right? They're really kind of a neutral party and they're really helping you think about what you want, what goals you have for your relationship. They're not invested in whether you stay together or where, whether you get divorced, like that is, or, or whether you separate. That is a decision that the couple has to make. But I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of what is the differences between couples therapy and say those meetings that you may have with your religious leader uh, for folks who, you know, who have, who are of faith, I may maybe start first with talking to their religious leader about how, how are they navigating a challenge in their relationship? Or do you see that there are differences and what do the, each piece has to offer? Sure. Yeah, that's such a great question because I think that they're equally important and extremely complementary to one another, especially when done well. Um, as you said, yes, I am a person of faith. And so as a uh, believer in the Christian faith, I think it's important to understand why marriage uh, is rooted in whatever your belief system is, but Mm -hmm. what that means, because your faith system will really inform how you make decisions, how you define commitment, how you define family, uh, and the ultimate foundation of the purpose of why your relationship exists. Uh, yet there's also this missing component um, or needed component, I shouldn't say missing, but this needed component of understanding human behavior, which is where couples therapy comes in. Because when you have someone who is trained uh, in human behavior, science, and the things that uh, we've been discussing in this conversation, then that is absolutely such an important uh, balance and space where couples can really have greater understanding to strengthen their foundation, understanding of their relationship and their own patterns, their, their patterns as a couple mm-hmm. and further strengthen their goals as a couple outside of uh, the faith realm. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So the idea is that there is not, you don't have to choose, right? Right. That, that those, they're both things that can help build and, and strengthen that relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Last question. Um, any tips or advice that you would give to couples who are just starting out or couples who've been in it for a minute? How do, what are some things, maybe one or two things that we could do? And I put me in there because, you know, we've been a couple for 20 <laughs> years now. <laughs> we're just noticing that, which is like hard to believe. Uh, but again, that there's always things you want to kind of, you know, keep fresh and, and, and check in on. But how do we, what are some tips to maintain in a healthy balance um, for your your own mental health um, as an individual, but also the well-being of that 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 union? Absolutely. First of all, congratulations on 20. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I know, right? It is. I was like, I can't imagine. I look back at pictures and like, oh my God, we look so young. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um if I were to, there's a lot of things, but if I were to prioritize mm-hmm. two things, I think um, being creative mm-hmm. and it doesn't mean planning extravagant things or dates or vacations. Those are, those are fun too. Yes. But what about weekly check-ins? What about weekly? Oh, I cooked your favorite meal today. Just, just mm-hmm. creating those spaces where you are showing that you're actively invested. You're actually actively thinking about your partner, you're actively invested in making sure that the relationship is where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there's this sort of, if you will, to use the five five love languages language, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that sort of just Mm action-based. Are we checking Mm -hmm. in? Are we communicating? Are we demonstrating? Mm -hmm. Are we being intentional? Yeah. And then the other thing I think is community. What supports Mm -hmm. do you have in place? 
Mm-hmm. Is it that friend circle that you trust? Are there other couples that you spend time with that you trust just as sort of accountability mm-hmm. uh, check in? Mm-hmm. I love that. So com- building community, make sure you have community mm-hmm. and being creative. So doing little things. So I think that there's another tip within there, like understanding what your partner's love language is. And there mm-hmm. are lots, I think there's a test out there. I know my husband and I did it. Um, a while ago mine is quality time so we referenced that right <laughs> his is act of service you know mm-hmm. so like let's watch a movie together like I feel close to you when we do that he's like can you clean the house <laughs> can you clean your space right and I know if I do that he's gonna feel good right so I think that's a great tip right um uh, understanding kind of what each other needs in that in, in that space right oh this has been wonderful oh my god so Thank you. And I, I do want to ask one question because um, this last thing, promise. So you have the book is called Before the Broom. And so when I saw that, I assume like for people who are getting together, but my sense is this is at any point along that relationship journey, right? Because there's probably always something that we could do to improve and kind yeah. of work on our relationship. Yeah. So we specifically said for dating engaged and newly married African-American couples. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I feel like it's a timeless resource. Yeah. Because a lot of us are in relationships where maybe we didn't have the depth of this understanding that we're trying to offer the community now. And so why not check in and and do some renewal, if you will, of understanding and recommitting to the relationship? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Well, thank you, Dr. Jess. Always wonderful to speak with you and um, can't wait to share this with with all. But um, thank you again for your time and thank you for writing that book along with your co-authors. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure. All right.